Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today at today's national at the National Conference of State Legislators webinar on COVID-19, the consumer credit, and data. Uh, my name is Senator David Carlucci, co-chair of the NCSL Communications, Financial Services, and Interstate Commerce Committee, and I'll be your moderator for today. This is the last webinar in the consumer uh, in the Communications, Financial Services, and Interstate Commerce Committee COVID-19 webinar series. We have had two previous webinars, including discussions on mortgage issues and consumer lending in the age of COVID-19. For recordings of previous webinars, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to review a few housekeeping items. Today's webinar is a platform for information exchange and engagement. Over the next 60 minutes, we encourage participation through our chat box, so feel free to type your questions and, and answer any questions in the chat box on your screen. To begin building some comfort with the chat function and to also learn who is on the line today, I invite you to type in the state from which you are calling in. We will hold a formal Q&A after our presen presenters are finished presenting. Many of you will want to download the slides for today's webinar. You can find the PDF version of the slides by opening the tab labeled Resources. The tabs are found just above the presentation window. Another tab is labeled Speaker, where you can read the bios of today's speakers. You can access these tabs and at any time during the presentation. If you have trouble downloading the presentation, please email Abby Grewal, our CFI committee staff at Abby Gruwell at ncsl.org, and she will send you the deck of slides. The webinar platform we are using is optimized for use in Google Chrome. We recommend any exper anyone experiencing technical difficulties to try signing in through Chrome instead. If you continue to experience difficulties, please email registration at ncsl.org. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on NCSL's website within a week. The National Conference of State Legislatures is the bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff of the state's commonwealths and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues and is an effective and respected advocate for the interests of the states in the American federal system. NCSL developed a webpage to house our comprehensive resources on the state and federal response to COVID-19. Here you can find a database with up-to-date real-time information about bills related to and responding to COVID-19 that have been introduced in the 50 states, Puerto Rico, Guam, and the District of Columbia archives of previous webinars, information on state policies, and response, responses related to the continuity of government and other important considerations during the, this unprecedented time. Now that the housekeeping details are out of the way, let's get to our presentation. The COVID-19 pandemic has challenged the ability of many consumers to repay their debts, and experts have been closely watching to measure the impact on credit applications, credit scores, and data reporting. Policymakers have considered a wide variety of options to address these issues, including comment codes, credit freezes, and lender assistance. The three nationwide credit bureaus have also responded by offering free credit reports and services, including credit monitoring. This webinar will discuss how states and the federal government are responding to credit data and debt issues related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Joining us today are Brian Bucks from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Eric Elman from the Consumer Data Industry Association, and from the Urban Institute, we have Signa Mary McKiernan and Caleb Quackenbush. First up, we have Signa Mary McKiernan and Caleb Quackenbush from the Urban Institute. Signa Mary is the Vice President of the Centra Center on Labor, Human Services, and Population, and Director of the Opportunity and Ownership Initiative. She focuses on national wealth building, poverty, access to assets and credit, and the impact of safety net programs. 
Caleb's research examines widen, widening wealth inequalities, interventions to help families improve their financial well-being, and long-term trends in the federal budget and tax expenditures. Thank you so much for joining us today. The floor, the floor is yours. I'll turn it over to Signa Mary and Caleb. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Carlucci. Um, my colleague Caleb and I will spend the next 10 minutes or so providing evidence on credit health, focusing especially on what we're seeing with vulnerable populations. We'll talk about why credit health is important, who's experiencing disparate impacts, and that's communities of color and the young, how common debt and collections is, and policy solutions. Before we start, Here's a little background on the Urban Institute, in case you're not familiar. The Urban Institute is a nonprofit research institute in Washington, D.C., with a staff of over 500. We're driven by a passion to ensure that everyone, regardless of income, race, education, or where they live, has the chance to achieve their highest potential. Uh, we don't advocate or lobby. Experts from the Urban Institute, like Caleb and me, uh, we speak for ourselves, too, not for the Institute. So credit uh, and debt can be a lifeline during emergencies by providing the ability to pay for medical care or for a car repair. Uh, debt can also be a bridge to opportunity through education, home ownership, and through a car to get to work. But debt, which can stem both from credit or unpaid bills, often burdens families and communities' financial well-being. Having debt and collections creates problems not just for today, but for tomorrow. Debt and collections can lower your credit score and make it harder to borrow or access credit in the future, such as whether you'll be able to get a mortgage or borrow for a small business. Um, and it means that when you do borrow, it will cost more. Having a subprime credit score is costly. Uh, this figure here shows the expected difference for three common purchases across subprime and prime consumers, a car, a refrigerator, or a car repair. A consumer with a subprime credit score can expect to pay three times as much for a car loan. So that's nearly $4,000 in interest as compared with just over $1,000 for someone with a prime credit score. They can expect to pay almost three times as much when they go to buy a refrigerator. Um, and about twice as much for a car repair. And, and we didn't include the difference on a mortgage on this chart because it's off the chart. Consumers with subprime credit could pay nearly $90,000 more. In addition, subprime consumers may be excluded from the mainstream credit system. By being denied a mortgage, for example, people with a subprime credit score are excluded from powerful asset and wealth building opportunities. So who is experiencing disproportionate burden in credit health, even before the pandemic? Um, and two groups stand out, both the young and communities of color. Nearly one in three adults with credit records have some form of debt and collections. So that's nearly every third person you pass um, have that reported on their credit reports. Medical debt and collections is unpaid debt owed to hospitals and other medical providers, and it's the most common type of debt and collections. So the first group who has a disproportionate amount of medical debt and collections may surprise you. Urban Institute research finds that millennials and Gen X are more likely to have past due medical debt than baby boomers and people in the silent generation. You'd expect older Americans to have health problems but these findings are consistent with what we know about health insurance. People with health insurance are at a lower risk of having past due medical debt, and people over age 65 in America have federal health insurance, thanks to Medicare. So these findings here are pre-COVID, and if you're wondering what's happening now, Urban Institute survey data suggests that the youngest adults are struggling. At the start of the pandemic, almost a third of Gen Z adults reported worrying about affording medical costs. Uh, using data from a major credit bureau, we find that among people with a credit record, the share of young millennials with a subprime credit score increases with age, especially for millennials who live in communities of color. So the first set of bars in this figure 
shows the share uh, for 18 to 20 year olds, the second for 21 to 24 year olds, and the third for 25 to 29 year olds. And compared with young millennials ages 18 to 20, a greater share of those ages 21 to 24 have subprime credit. Um, and the levels are even worse for 25 to 29 year olds. Importantly, nearly half of all millennials ages 21 to 29 who live in a community of color um, and have a credit record have a subprime credit score. So this raises important questions about how young people are entering our credit system. Are they entering because of fines and fees or by co-signing a credit card with an adult? Um, this subprime score leaves them vulnerable to high cost predatory lending and can severely limit their ability to build wealth as they move into their 30s and beyond. This is a direct result of generations of systemic racism, historical lack of access to quality health care, and policies like redlining that kept black, black Americans from owning homes and building wealth to fall back on. So in the United States, the expectation is that every generation does better than the previous one. But this is no longer the case. Um, you know, we're talking here about today's young and people of color. That's the future of our country. So next, I'll turn it over to Caleb to share a little bit more on how common debt and collections is, how that varies by state and county, uh, and some policy solutions. Thanks, Signa Mary, and good afternoon. Uh, as Signa Mary mentioned, debt and collections is widespread. So in 2019, uh, when the economy was in a much stronger state than it is now, 68 million Americans had debt and collections. So this map is taken from Debt in America, an interactive data tool available on our Vinter Institute's website, and we'll link to that in the slides, um, that's designed to help policymakers, media, and other stakeholders understand the patterns of debt in their communities and advance solutions that increase families' financial well-being. So looking at, at the national picture, uh, we can see a few patterns emerge. Uh, first off, um, nearly one in third Americans with a credit file have debt and collections. So that's the 31% you see on this slide. But there's also a share um, that's especially high in the South. So Louisiana, for example, has the highest share of debt and collections among states, 44% of residents there. In contrast, Minnesota has the lowest share of debt and collections, 16%. The data also show that debt and collections is higher in communities of color than it is in white communities, reflecting decades of inequality that's left families of color with less access to good credit terms and fewer resources to fall back on during hard times. While 26% of residents in majority white communities had debt and collections, 42% of residents in community of color had debt and collections. Uh, zooming in, we can also see that our data reveal differences within states. For example, in Texas, you can see that many of the counties near the U.S.-Mexico border have particularly high debt in, in collections, it's about two-thirds of residents in DeMitt County. Meanwhile, um, as a few of the counties in the central part of the state have lower shares, the lowest being about one-fourth of residents in Mason County. So I encourage you to visit the tool and explore the data in your state. Um, we're also going to be updating this data later this year to reflect data for August 2020, um, so in the middle of the pandemic. And we're also going to be launching new data tools uh, tracking credit health changes over time during the pandemic this fall. So please keep an eye out for that. Uh, these next uh, couple of slides describe actions that states are exploring and using um, to both reduce short-term emergency hard uh, hardships during the pandemic and to help families build long-term resilience. Uh, these policy options are aimed at helping people through keeping healthcare affordable and accessible, providing financial breathing room, and protecting households' credit savings and assets. Uh, for example, many jurisdictions in the U.S. have imposed moratoria on evictions and utility shutoffs during the pandemic. State leaders could monitor how economic conditions are changing in their jurisdictions and consider either implementing uh, such a moratoria in their state or extending moratoria if one is already in effect. Uh, another recent example in New York, uh, the Department of Financial Services there used a governor's emergency executive order and its own regulatory authority to waive fees on ATM use, account overdrafts, and late credit card payments for 90 days. Thinking about some uh, longer-term solutions, um, 37 uh, states and D.C. have expanded Medicaid so far. The Urban Institute research has found that Medicaid expansions under the Affordable Care Act decrease the likelihood that consumers experience new medical debt and collections 
um, among other improvements, such as improved credit scores and the reduced probability of having one or more uh, recent medical bills go into collections. And as a final example, policies that reduce barriers and increase uh, incentives to save can help families build their own cushion to weather against economic hardship. And this is very important because we found that even as little as 250 the $750 in savings matters for outcomes such as avoiding eviction, missing housing and utility payments, um, or using public benefits after an income shock. And urban uh, research has found that uh, lowering asset tests or reducing asset tests also um, increases uh, safety net program participants uh, in SNAP, um, savings and bank account use. Thanks for listening. Uh, once again, uh, the slides will link to some of the resources that we've shared, and we'll hand it back over to NCSL. Uh, while we're waiting for the senator, um, next we have Brian Bucks from the CFPB. I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you. I'm very pleased to have a chance to, to follow that background uh, from Signa Mary and Caleb. What I want to do in the next few minutes is uh, give a first read on what uh, some of the credit bureau data tell us about consumers' credit situations in the early uh, parts of this pandemic, up through as recently uh, data pretty much available through June in some cases. Uh, and then close with a few thoughts on uh, what, might, what might be down the road here. So um, looks like somebody else may be flipping through slides. Uh, but if you could get my slides up, um, thank you. The uh, I'm having difficulty. I may need somebody else to run the slides then because my screen is jumping up and down on me. If you could advance to the next slide. Thank you. So as I said, I wanted to start with just a quick overview of what the Credit Bureau data show us right now about consumers' financial position. Um, the uh, what this table shows you draws on a report from Experian that uh, I hope you can find the links to here on the on the webinar uh, because these data are in some cases available at the state level as well. Uh, we show, for example, average scores and average debt balance uh, before the pandemic hit uh, in January of 2020 compared to May of 2020. You see average scores moved up by about five points from 681 to 686, not a big movement in credit scores. Average total debt balances have dropped by about 1%. 1 Average credit card balances more dramatically. Uh, there's some evidence that uh, balances on personal loans have gone up, but most types of debt have seen reductions in uh, balances. And somewhat similarly, you see is the average number of 30-day delinquencies in the past 12 months, according to Experian, has actually gone down um, between January and May as we've had the first few months of, of the pandemic. Uh, again, that's uh, the delinquency numbers. It can depend is uh, which product you're looking at and whether you're looking at 30 day or 60 day delinquencies. But um, it does, generally there have not been big movements in delinquency rates yet either, which might be surprising. And in fact, looking at these, these measures and others as a whole, uh, the labor market disruption and other effects of the pandemic and the, and the shutdown um, to limit the spread of the virus have no, don't appear to have had a dramatic effect on, on consumers' credit situations. Um, moving, though, to an important response to the, uh, the crisis under the, um, the pandemic under the CARES Act was, of course, expanding the use of uh, accommodations hardship accommodations, such as um, flagging loans as being in forbearance, deferral, or subject to a natural disaster. And that's what this table, drawn from some, tra from some transunion data, shows, namely the share of accounts by different types of products, auto, mortgage, and bank cards, that had one of these accommodations, these hardship accommodations, 
um, on, on the loan at various times. Looking at the far right, you see those percentages for June 2020. We have, for example, 7% um, of auto loans uh, currently have the hardship flag on them of one kind or another, just about 7% of mortgages, and 3.6% of credit cards. Those are obviously dramatic increases relative to uh, the share of accounts with these flags one year ago in June of 2019, and just a few months earlier in March of 2020, where you can see those percentages for auto and mortgages were on the order of about uh, a half of a percentage point, and bank cards, which is one in, in 10,000. Um, so seeing dramatic increases in the share of loans with with these uh, natural disaster forbearance or deferral codes. Though to be clear, these are still only on the order of uh, five to 10% of all accounts have these. Um, data from elsewhere suggests that about 15% of consumers, I believe, have a hardship status on at least one of their loans. Um, the uh, CFPB looked in a, a, a May report at one of the first indicators that one can pick up in the credit bureau data of, of consumers' response to the pandemic in terms of their credit, and that's inquiries for new credit. Uh, inquiries for credit are reported almost immediately to the credit bureaus. And uh, so what this chart is able to show is how they – share of people with a hard inquiry, that is a, an actual loan application, an attempt to get credit, changed over time relative to the first week of March. So right as the, the, um, the pandemic was, was getting a grip, um, you can follow the shares of consumers trying to get a loan, an auto loan on the far left, a new mortgage, looking for a new revolving credit card or some other type of loan. You see those week by week all the way through March, the end of April, very beginning of May, showing, for example, that in the first, the, the second week of March, so relative to the first week of March, we saw an over 10%, almost 15% drop in the share of, of inquiries relative to what we would have expected given historical patterns for inquiries over time over, the, over these weeks. We saw about a 10 to 15% drop in the share of people applying for a new auto loan. And that, um, that drop got steeper and steeper. And by uh, the end of the month, by the end of March, we were well over 50% drop in uh, auto inquiries. Those auto inquiries then turned back up, but still remained a uh, good 20% lower uh, than we would have otherwise expected in a normal year by the end of April, early May. Those were the sharpest drops were for auto inquiries. And incidentally, we saw that uh, auto sales were quite low in the second quarter of this year. So uh, these inquiries appear to be tied uh, at least initially to durable goods purchases and in particular the purchases of cars. You see drops in all of the types of inquiries in the credit bureau data throughout March and April. They're not as steep generally um, as we saw for auto inquiries. Uh, and they have started to recover. In fact, for mortgages, which is the second set of bars there, second from the left, you see that mortgage inquiries have almost come back to the, the level we would expect. Credit card inquiries remain fairly low. Uh, but there does seem to be some sign that consumers aren't looking as hard for credit that maybe they need it less, or it may be that they're anticipating that credit standards have tightened. These data on inquiries can't distinguish, distinguish those two hypotheses. Um, but one thing we can tie that to a little bit is shown in this slide, which just looks at how consumer spending has changed over the course of the pandemic to date. What this slide shows is the percentage change in average credit card and debit card spending um, over time relative to January 2020. These data are drawn from research by Raj Chetty and others. Again, the links to these are, uh, should be available in the webinar. Um, using some fairly novel data, looking at, as I said, credit card and debit card spending over time. And what you see here is that up through um, 
early March, uh, spending spending was little changed relative to its January levels, but then dropped very sharply um, in in mid March into April. But the spending began to recover once we saw the CARES Act implemented, and then as stimulus payments uh, uh, began to be mailed out. They've recovered, and I, I apologize, I've actually got the little slider bar when I took the screenshot here. The slider bar seems to be sitting in mid-June uh, and shows that by mid-June, uh, spending was now down only about 10% compared to being down about 30% um, right in, at the beginning of April. Uh, it's now somewhere about recovered to a little under 10% drop in, in spending um, now in the most recent months. And in fact, as I was looking today, it looks like they just updated the data for this chart, which they do every two weeks. So if you go and look at the, uh, the chart today, it'll look a little bit different from this one, um, but the conclusions are fairly similar. By the way, all of those gray bars, uh, gray lines in the background are uh, the lines for individual states um, and the District of Columbia. Uh, these data are actually also available at county level if you want to be able to dig down uh, in smaller geographic areas and see how spending has changed. But in almost all cases, when you look at total spending, what you see is very dramatic declines at the end of March and a gradual recovery. Uh, it differs by state, um, but in some cases now approaching normal levels of spending once again. When you dig into these data a little more deeply, what you see is that um, much of the spending recovery have been driven by the lowest income households. Uh, these are using income based on uh, zip code of the individual. So it's not exactly household level income, but it does a fairly good job of approximating uh, income for households. What you see here are those same spending patterns we saw on the prior slide. Over time, you see the dramatic drop uh, in, in March into early April in spending, and then the gradual recovery. What you see though relative to the dotted lines is that when those stimulus payments came in uh, came into effect, uh, though both both the spending for the high income households, those in the top income quartile, which are shown in green, and the spending for those in the bottom income quartile, started to recover. The recovery was nearly complete in spending for low income households. And this is consistent with some other evidence that stimulus payments, the economic incentive payments. Um, we're going almost directly into spending for low-income households, much more so than for high-income households. Um, so with that background on how to date, we haven't seen dramatic changes in typical measures of consumers' credit health, like their credit score, average balances, and delinquency rates. Uh, we have seen changes in inquiries and changes in spending. Um, but where I'm left uh, is saying we still have yet to see the full effects of the, uh, of the pandemic, in part because we've to date had many policy measures that have potentially softened the blow of the pandemic's uh, economic effects. We've also, as mentioned earlier, seen that credit reporting, um, we've had a number of measures like def increased forbearances, deferrals, and use of natural disaster codes that could blunt the effect on credit records that mask troubles consumers might normally be having meeting, uh, meeting their bills. So over time, it may be that as UI benefits, or the economic impact payments, eviction and foreclosure moratoria, as Caleb mentioned, if those are phased out or, or continue at reduced levels, or if households exhaust their savings, uh, we may begin to see more effects on households' credit conditions. I also note, I'm, I meant to mention this earlier, that of course all of these statistics are aggregate statistics. We did a little bit of breakdown by income in that, but of course that, that masks a lot of variation across, across consumers and households. Um, and another caveat here is that of course, in looking at credit bureau data, we can only speak to the condition of those who have a credit record. But importantly, about 10% of U.S. adults are credit invisible. That means by our best estimates, they do not have a credit record. Uh, and a little smaller fraction, probably around 8% of consumers or adults have a credit record, but 
it's a very thin or stale file, and so they have no credit score. Uh, so some of the implications for being able to get affordable credit that Signa Mary talked about apply there as well. Um, if you don't have a credit score, even if you've got a credit record. And rates of credit and visibility are higher in low income areas, they're higher for racial and ethnic minorities, and they tend to be higher in rural areas and in the principal cities of urban areas. Um, so that's, again, one, one element of the variation we see across households and consumers' experiences uh, uh, and our ability to measure those, both currently and going forward. With that, I'll turn it back to NCSL. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, next, uh, also, that was a great presentation, and I'm sure it did generate questions from our participants. So if you do have questions, please submit your questions by typing them in the chat box in the lower left corner of your screen, and we will get through as many questions as we can. Our final present presenter is Eric Elman. He's the Senior Vice President for Public Policy and Legal Affairs at the Consumer Data Industry Association and leads the association's Government Affairs Program and Legal Department. CDIA is the International Trade Association that represents consumer data companies, the nation's leading institutions in credit reporting, mortgage reporting, check verification, fraud prevention, risk management, employment screening, and tenant screening. Eric, I, I turn it over to you now. Great, thank you, Senator, and uh, I appreciate your moderation of this panel, and also a thank you not just to you, Senator, but also to the NCSL staff for putting this together. Uh, and to all of you who I can't see out there uh, in the audience, but uh, I, I know you're there. Uh, let me give you a little background on CDIA, uh, if I may. We are, as the, uh, Senator Carlucci mentioned, we are a trade association of the United States Consumer Reporting System, uh, including Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion, which are the nationwide credit bureaus that all of you are familiar with. We, are founded, were founded in 1906, and amongst the many things that we do is we work very hard with our members to help consumers meet their financial goals at all of the stages of their life, whatever those financial goals are. Let me give you a quick high-level overview of the consumer reporting ecosystem, which is made up of four principal components. It is data furnishers who are furnish data to consumer reporting agencies or credit bureaus, if you will. And then there are data users who use the data provided from the consumer reporting agencies or credit bureaus. And of course, and most importantly, are the consumers themselves. And as you can see in this slide, uh, at every step of the way, there are data furnishers, credit bureaus, and data users that have responsibilities under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act and, uh, and consumer rights available to consumers, again, under the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, uh, which is a good segue to say that all of our members are regulated and heavily regulated by the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, and uh, most states have a credit reporting statute or credit reporting law as well, and our members are regulated naturally by both uh, federal and state credit reporting laws. Uh, data furnishers report data to the credit bureaus in what we call the Metro 2 format, which is a universal standardized data reporting format. There are about 15,000 data furnishers that report into the three nationwide credit bureaus, and they all report on the Metro 2 data format to keep everything standard, consistent, uniform, and to allow everyone in the ecosystem to meet their accuracy obligations under the SCRA. The Metro 2 format undergoes significant revisions every year to keep up uh, with the times. Uh, as you can see from this matrix, which may be a little hard to see depending upon your vantage point on your screen, but this gives you uh, an, an overview of the matrix of supervision, regulation, and enforcement of all of the players in the credit reporting ecosystem. That again means both data for, or it means data users, data furnishers, and credit bureaus. Let's uh, chat a little bit about reporting on consumers in financial distress, which is obviously a big point of the focus of this series that NCSL has put together. Uh, lenders and creditors are strongly encouraged, as we all know, by both federal and state regulatory bodies 
to find accommodations for consumers. And those accommodations include things like payment holidays and forbearance, deferred payments, et cetera. And it also uh, includes potentially placing disaster codes on consumer credit files. The Metro 2 format has long had codes in place. Uh, in fact, even before September 11th, it had codes in place to handle uh, consumers affected by financial hardship and financial distress for whatever the reason is for that financial distress, whether it is uh, natural disasters, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, uh, loss of employment or other financial situations. When a data furnisher reports to a credit bureau that a consumer is in a forbearance or deferred payment plan, the bureaus are, have long been set up with codes to handle those kinds of specific uh, notations. And the leading third-party score modeling companies, Vantage Score and FICO, have indicated a number of times in a number of ways their work to minimize the impact on consumer scores when a consumer is reported in uh, forbearance, deferred, or other uh, situation. And I would encourage those who want more details about credit scores to visit the uh, FICO website and the Vantage Score website. Natural disasters is another way that consumers uh, can be reported uh, for being in a financial hardship. Primarily, the natural disaster code had been used for natural disasters like hurricanes and floods and tornadoes, earthquakes and things like that, but are also used in times of other national crisis like uh, the COVID-19 situation that we find ourselves in uh, right now. We go back here, and again, when a furnisher is reported with a disaster code, uh, again, there are steps that score modelers take to help minimize the impact uh, of, the, uh, of the presence of a natural disaster code. A quick note on the CARES Act that uh, many of you are probably familiar with. Congress passed the CARES Act in, in late March, which requires uh, under the FCRA, which amended the FCRA to require a furnisher who, is, who puts a consumer in an accommodation to report them as current. And some of the data that we've seen, as was talked about just a few minutes ago by the CFPB, indicates that it seems like these accommodations are working based upon the data we've seen. And I've seen some other recent data uh, from uh, another credit bureau, which essentially uh, repeat that kind of uh, process that, uh, again, accommodations seem to be holding and accommodations seem to be working for consumers. Um, a couple of thoughts uh, before I turn back to my regularly scheduled presentation, but I want to react to a couple of things that were said uh, before. Our, my colleagues on the panel from the, uh, from the Urban Institute, I think it is, made a couple of comments about medical debt and fines and fees, and I want to spend just a moment talking about that because these are important uh, for your background as well. There was some data that was put up uh, indicating the presence and perhaps significant presence of medical debt on, uh, that consumers are under. As some of you may be aware, a number of years ago, Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion entered into a, uh, a voluntary program called the National Consumer Assistance Plan, or NCAP. And one of the many things that the NCAP did was address medical debt such that there is now a 180-day delay between the uh, medical debt uh, being incurred and when that medical debt goes on to a consumer's credit report. This is unpaid medical debt, and I'll get to paid medical debt in just a second. We learned a long time ago, of course, that consumers are often stuck in a ping pong match between a medical care provider and an insurance company about who is paying for what. And consumers uh, may have been penalized uh, on their credit histories because they were stuck in this ping pong match between the insurance companies and their health care medical care providers. So to help mitigate against that ping pong match that consumers might have been stuck in is there's now a 180 day delay, I said, between, as I said, between the reporting of the unpaid medical debt to when it actually goes on to a consumer's credit report. Now for paid medical debt, paid medical debt, again, under the NCAP is not going to be loaded onto a consumer's credit report. And if in fact a consumer's unpaid medical debt goes onto a credit file because it's 181 days or later, uh, when that medical debt gets paid, it comes off of the credit report. Another comment was made about fines and fees and another part of the NCAP program that was released a number of years ago by the three nationwide credit bureaus, fines and fees generally don't make their way into credit reports anymore. They may have at one point, 
uh, but it's been many years since they have. Uh, and I guess uh, the one other point I wanted to make, picking up on a comment from the CFPB about uh, about what we would call no-hits or thin files, which are underserved consumers who may not be participating fully in the credit marketplace. Equifax, Experian, TransUnion are deeply committed, as are many of our other members, to bringing consumers into the financial and the credit mainstream. And we are working uh, very hard with uh, utility companies and telecom companies and landlords and others to encourage them to report to the credit bureaus. It is in everybody's best interest that everybody participate as fully as possible in the financial mainstream. And that's a big part of our members' work as well. So let me turn uh, to a couple of other thoughts here, and then I guess we'll be taking questions pretty shortly. One of the, one of the arguable solutions that's been talked about uh, in Congress and in some state legislatures, uh, including uh, Senator Carlucci's in New York, is this idea of preventing reporting of data to the credit reporting system. And that's actually probably the worst thing for consumers for a number of reasons that I could spend a lot more time on that we have here on this call. But data suppression is harmful to consumers and harmful to the credit reporting system for many reasons. Uh, when data is being suppressed or not reported to the credit bureaus, that means it's not being updated, including, in fact, if a consumer is uh, subjected uh, to a natural disaster, that notation is not going to make its way into a file. Positive payments don't get reported either. And suppression overall means less accurate credit reports, less reliable credit scoring models, and overall significantly more credit risk in the system, which ultimately bears out in higher cost per credit uh, for everybody and less credit available for all consumers. Some quick resources for you. Uh, the CDIA website has, uh, at our landing page, has a specific COVID-19 page that you can navigate to that has quite a few resources available to consumers and to data furnishers, to data users, and to regulators uh, about credit reporting and COVID-19. Equifax, Experian, and TransUnion all make information available, uh, consumer-centric information available to them. I already referred you uh, a few slides ago to the FICO and Vantage Score websites if you have specific credit scoring questions. Annualcreditreport.com is a place where consumers can go to get free reports. And as I think many of you are probably aware, uh, a month or two ago, the Nationwide Credit Bureau has announced that they are uh, providing significantly more free consumer reports to consumers than beyond, than well beyond what the law allows, which is just one free credit report per year per credit bureau. And then lastly, if I can be of any service to you, uh, questions that you might have after this call, uh, please, after this webinar, please feel free to reach out to me at the email address that you see there on the screen. So with that, uh, Mr. Chairman and NCSL staff, uh, uh, I think maybe it's time for questions, but I guess, Senator, you'll take it from here. Thank you, Eric. Really appreciate it. <clears throat> and you're exactly right. It's that time for questions. So if anybody does have additional questions, please put them in the chat. Uh, we will be happy to take them. We do have a few questions, and I want to thank all the presenters on this extremely important information that affects all of us but many of us know little about it. And um, I know I've learned quite a bit over the past couple of years about um, consumer credit and data. And um, to start off, we do have a few questions for our presenters today. And um, you know, this morning I sent out an email um, and letting residents in my district in New York know that we were doing this uh, presentation today on consumer credit and data. And within a minute of sending out the email blasts, um, I got some responses, um, almost as if people were waiting at home, waiting for this uh, to, to come on. So I was really excited to see that. But some of them are real simple. And if we could start off, I had this question um, from a resident in my district. And he asked, um, regarding merchants adding non-cash fees to credit card users. So this is an issue that we're seeing in regards to how we're asking residents to not use cash because of COVID. Um, but now that uh, that's happening, we're seeing some merchants add a fee. 
Um, and so the uh, resident asked, this fee is in addition to credit card companies charging annual fees and adds to the cardholders' monthly payments, creating additional interest charges if the balance is not paid in full. Um, and and the, the questioner wanted to know what can be done about that, what is being done about it. And I figured um, that would be a great way to start if anybody had any comments or suggestions about that. And basically the question is what can be done about as we're moving more and more to credit, and in some cases, uh, retailers, uh, merchants not even accepting cash, um, what can be done about them even a a asking more for those by paying by credit? Is that a question anybody would be able to answer or wants to talk about? Well, Senator, this is Eric. I, that's really not part of our work at the consumer reporting industry. That may be a question better directed to uh, a banking organization, a banking association. I'm just not really equipped to answer that, and I, I will leave it to my other fellow panelists to respond or not. Um, this is Signa Mary. Um, I'll just jump in with some related uh, evidence and what we're seeing right now. Um, and that is that to be part of our mainstream economy today, having a safe and affordable checking or savings account is key, right? So we're talking about cash or credit here. Um, and we saw you know, delays in those really important relief payments to people who didn't have bank accounts. Right. And then our financial system is built more and more on top of those uh, bank accounts, like the financial technology is often built on top of this platform. So I think it does speak to the need um, of having bank accounts and some of the state policies in um, asset limits in their means-tested programs, which are um, making people less likely to have a bank account and also to keep less savings. So that's a policy option there. Mm. Yeah, it seems that as we're moving more and more to a cashless system, that the unbanked, underbanked uh, poses even more problems than previously previously existed, which have been uh, great problems. So it's something that you know, we definitely have to pursue. Um, some other questions that we had is, um, and some of them have been touched upon by the presenters, but I just wanted to ask uh, some other questions. Um, how did the lender requirements in the CARES Act affect consumers, and why is it important that credit data is accurately reported? Um, and then on top of that, um, we, in addition to that, what can we expect in terms of the long-term effects on credit? Because effects on credit reporting can be delayed, when will we truly see the effect that COVID will have on consumers? Well, this is, this is, this is Eric, Senator. Let me, let me take a, a first run at that, and, and then I suspect some of my other fellow panelists might have a few thoughts as well. Uh, the law, let me start with a, a comment that you had made about why accuracy is important. It's accuracy is important for a number of reasons. First of all, the law demands it. Both uh, the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act and State Credit Reporting Acts all have accuracy obligations on data furnishers, data users, and credit peers. And I think it it's probably uh, goes without saying, but we'll just say it anyway, is that uh, if lenders do not have a complete and reliable view of a consumer's credit history, <laughs> if perhaps they look like better credit risks than they actually are, that ultimately means that lending institutions, credit card companies, banks, or whoever uh, are in uh, a significantly riskier lending position. And when loans go bad, whether it's car loans or mortgages or student loans or whoever, it's not necessarily, uh, in, well, it is in part the, uh, the consumer where the loan goes bad that suffers, but ultimately it's all of the other customers of the bank, the lending institution that have to eat those costs. And then in many cases, like in the mortgage marketplace and others, it's taxpayers uh, as a whole. One of the lessons we learned from the Great Recession in 08, 09, and beyond is that lenders have to take a very risk-focused approach to lending and granting credit, and they need to have a full and reliable picture of a consumer's credit history. 
that I think maybe it answers at least part of that question, Senator. Thank you. Any anyone else want to add to that? Uh, this is Signa Mary. I'd love to add too why it's um, important for institutions like lenders, but that accuracy is also important for um, for people. And that's because having uh, delinquent debt credit can be costly, as I explained earlier, but it's not just credit. What's on your credit report affects other parts of your life too. Credit report information is used to determine eligibility for jobs, right? We know a lot of people are looking for jobs right now. Um, access to rental housing, to mortgages, insurance premiums, and then um, just access to credit in general. I would I would agree um, with both those some of those points that both Eric and Signa Mary have raised. I think there's also a broader point about um, a, both lenders and consumers' faith and confidence in a credit uh, scoring system, and, and uh, that they're getting the best price they they can given their uh, their characteristics that accuracy plays into um, people's confidence in the system on both sides. Well, thank you. And then what do we think about in terms of all the deadlines uh, that have been pushed off? Um, what, what can we expect in terms of the long-term effects on credit? Uh, because credit reporting can be delayed, when will we truly see the effect that COVID will have on consumers? This is this is Brian. I uh, that's a question that was on the forefront of my mind as I as I put my talk together. I think that's a good one uh, because we have seen these measures that may have softened the initial effect of the pandemic, uh, and there is some research um, uh, that has looked at how uh, delinquency rates changed after Hurricane Harvey. And it found that, um, that uh, in fact, some of the spikes in delinquencies occurred closer to a year after the event. Um, so that there is some evidence in that situation, which is not a perfect analog, but um, uh, certainly was one of the times we've seen wide, more widespread use in a smaller geographic area of, of natural disaster flags, that the effects are not immediate. Um, or merely short-lived. So I think that is uh, an important question, um, but I don't know, <laughs> the, to which I do not know the answer. How about that? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. I know it's something we're all, we're all thinking of and anticipating. Yeah, Senator, this is, this is Eric. A, a quick thought or two, picking up on uh, Brian's comment. The, uh, again, I think that we, I don't think we have a, a full picture of what long-term impact might be. Uh, it is clear that as long as financial institutions are working with and accommodating consumers, there that, uh, as Brian had put it, that creates a soft landing for consumers. Uh, using the uh, the hurricane analogy, based upon some work that we did, Senator, in your home state of New York, following Superstorm Sandy a number of years ago. We took a look at credit scores shortly before the storm. We took a look at credit scores uh, shortly after the storm. And then longitudinally, we looked at credit scores uh, about a year, maybe just under a year after the storm had hit. And what we had found was that uh, overall consumers in the affected storm zones, that their scores dipped a little bit after immediately after the storm like 90 days after but nearly a year out their scores had the scores had actually gone up uh, there was a marginal increase but uh, but an increase nonetheless so I think it's a and, and these are consumers by the way who and these are consumers who are uh, in in the disaster zone but obviously uh, what we are experiencing now compared to this, the, the hurricane in Houston or the storm in New York pales by comparison to the current storm that we are now encountering. But uh, it obviously requires careful evaluation, careful reflection, and any policy changes that might be contemplated as a result have to be very thoughtfully 
uh, gamed out with a close eye on unintended consequences uh, and a close eye on 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 data and uh, and and science and data science. Well, well thank you. Um, we have a few more questions. Let's see if we can get them in. Um, another question we have is maybe the Urban Institute can answer this one: Is what is the other research and data uh, beyond credit bureau data showing about households' financial status and concerns? Thanks. Uh, so this is Caleb Quickenbush from Urban Institute, and uh, kind of building on some of my earlier points, but it, it might take a while for um, some of the hardships uh, to show up in, in credit data. Um, Urban Institute has done a few surveys of households um, just to get a sense of, of their sense of, of um, their financial well-being. Um, and during the pandemic, many families are, are worried about their finances. So some studies that we did in uh, March and April showed that large shares of Americans um, reported specific concerns about um, being able to pay for the kinds of things that will eventually show up on, on credit files. So um, being able to make uh, payments on debt, on uh, rent, mortgages, on utility bills, on medical costs. Um, and that's particularly high among people who um, lost income or had some sort of uh, job loss or reduced hours. So about two-thirds of people um, who had lost jobs reported that they were concerned about being able to pay their debts. Um, furthermore, there's at least some evidence that uh, people have increased, um, either increased their credit card spending or reduced their savings. Um, and we saw at least about a quarter of, of non-elderly adults who had lost uh, work-related income um, actually increased credit card spending during the pandemic or reported uh, doing so. Well, thank you. And a real last quick question. We talked about the those with no credit, and it was mentioned today. What can policymakers do to help those that have limited or no credit history? Uh, well, this is... First off, this is... Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, Brian, you go. Or whoever that was. Oh, this, is, this is Caleb. Um, again, uh, so just thinking about, yeah, helping, helping folks with, with limited or no um, credit history. So maybe in the short term, I, I think, um, you know, especially at the state level, the regulation of a small dollar credit of, um, of high cost loans in states and um, protection from unfair collection practices. Um, I think states should be sort of monitoring what's happening in the, in the payday lending market. Um, and then also thinking about uh, lowering barriers to alternative, uh, alternative access to credit. So uh, things like employer-sponsored uh, small dollar loans where, you know, you look at somebody's paycheck um, and they're good standing out of the company uh, and use that uh, to underwrite access to credit. Um, of course, that's only going to help people who um, are still employed. Um, but longer term, you can think about um, considering other alternatives to, to underwriting that can establish credit worthiness. So um, thinking about, you know, timely payment of, of rent or utilities or telephone. Um, since these are fairly new, some folks are using them, I think it would re require, you know, kind of carefully looking at who the winners and losers um, of those methods are and, and considering whether there might be any desperate impacts. But um, those are sort, sort of some shorter and longer term options that are available. Thank you, Eric. Did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, just uh, to pick up on a comment I made uh, a short time ago, as you recall, uh, that we in the credit reporting industry, consumer reporting industry, are deeply committed to expanding the pool of consumers who participate in the financial mainstream. And that means uh, working with policymakers perhaps to help encourage uh, them to use the voluntary system that we presently have to report things like telecom and utility data uh, and things like that. Uh, in fact, there are laws in some states, like uh, to your east, uh, Senator, in Connecticut, that act that actually prohibit the reporting of utility information to credit bureaus. So taking down some of those barriers, I think, would be helpful. One of the obstacles that we've heard from uh, alternative lender, uh, alternative data providers, is that there are significant regulatory impediments uh, to report data to consumer reporting agencies. So one of the challenges that I think regulators have is that if you create a significant regulatory body of law like the FCRA, uh, that potentially creates obstacles to having data furnishers take on those legal obligations. So I think some care might be in order in terms of looking at the regulatory burdens that are placed and maybe lowering some of those regulatory burdens that might be an obstacle to reporting data to credit bureaus. Well, thank you very much. I know the time flies and we're at a, an hour 
uh, of this presentation. I think it's been extremely valuable. And I just want to thank all the presenters today for sharing their time and expertise. And thank you to our audience for taking the time to participate in our webinar this afternoon. Uh, and a reminder that the archive of today's webinar will be posted on NCSL's website. Uh, it's a very valuable website with a lot of information. So to find the archive, go to ncsl.org, click on COVID-19 resource page, and select the webinar title. Uh, again, want to thank everyone for joining us and look forward to another presentation in the future. Uh, thank you again to all the presenters and everyone at NCSL that made this possible. Have a great day and enjoy the rest of the summer. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.